With the $5 meal deal at McDonald's, you pick a McDouble or a McChicken, then get a small fry, a small drink, and a four-piece McNuggets. That's a lot of McDonald's for not a lot of money. Price and participation may vary for a limited time only. It's Monday. It's July 15th. And the word of the day is alibi. Used in a sentence, Eli has an airtight alibi. I was with him all day Saturday, and he doesn't even know what a grassy <laughs> knoll is. I <laughs> don't even know that. Yeah, it's like JFK, except this one's going to take you back and to the far right. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I'd have taken six inches to the left, Marsh. I'm Eli Bosnick. <laughs> I'm Michael Marshall. I'm No Illusions, and broadcasting delayed from America's Far Center, we are the Skeptocrats. On this week's episode, we record the audio version of Marsh's Touchdown Dance. We do that before the Euro Cup Finals, just in case. Which means that by the time you hear this, I'll probably be ruining a shot that narrowly missed. (laughs) But first, the rest of the intro music. Joining me for headlines tonight are my fellow skeptic rats, Eli Bosnick and Michael Marshall. Gentlemen, England, France, and Iran all seem to get democracy right this year, uh, more or less. Does that give us any hope for November? November? No, I'm just hoping the shooter's Republican. (laughs) Yeah, the chances that November will go well are now looking worse than Trump's right earlobe. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So uh, let's get things out of the way. Uh, we record this show on Sunday morning, which means that the attempt on Trump's life was less than 24 hours ago when we're recording this. So we have very little information. That's why we're not doing a story on it. Uh, it would be pretty irresponsible for us to comment on the shooter or their motivations. And, and we want to remind you folks at home that there's a lot of fake news going around right now. So try not to be part of the problem, even if the news supports your side. And, and look, I know we joke about this stuff, but I think it goes without saying that it is never, ever okay not to aim for center mass. This isn't Fortnite, no, people. No, there's what no bonus doing? for headshots. This isn't a video game. Come on. <laughs> lazy. Lazy. And in our Marsh le- agrees with us. <laughs> <laughs> this is Silently also Marsh's opinion. Us, yes. I, Michael sil- Marshall of the Merseyside Skeptic <laughs> Society <laughs> and official representative of QED <laughs> Conference. <laughs> I'm trying to silently uh, <laughs> gear shift into jubilation from what is not oh, right, meant yeah, to be no, jubilation. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> and in our lead story tonight, after so long in the wilderness and after so many crushing defeats, so much misery, so many dashed dreams, we've finally done it. And along the way, we've had to prove that doubt is wrong. You know, the people who said that the leadership wasn't bold enough, that it wasn't inspiring enough, that there didn't appear to be a convincing plan, that you can't win just by being cautious and then waiting for your opponent to make a mistake. But all of those people have been proven wrong because England have made it to the final of a major international tournament. <laughs> okay. Oh, and also um, the Labour Party won the election. Oh, um, nice. Should probably mention that as well. Honestly, it's been quite a month for boring but competent men managing to slowly grind their way to historic victories, especially ones who seem to have very little interest in the left wing. Yeah. And we're... <laughs> And we're hoping that streak stays alive, Marsh. Uh, Yeah, a lot of things we're hoping stay alive, actually. (laughs) (laughs) So we're actually recording this show two hours or three hours before the Euro 2024 final, which is probably why I sound pretty tense right now. I I I thought it was our advocating for the assassination of political leaders. That's what I thought it was. (laughs) But it's it's not that. It's a little bold. It's not (laughs) that because he approves. He approves of it. But I I wish I was as certain about the England team's prospects as I was about Labour's prospects going into last week's election, because that writing had been on the wall for a while, and it increasingly just looked like a matter of time. And that time, it turns out, was 10pm on Thursday the 4th of July, when the exit polls predicted a historic Labour landslide. I was in the pub when the poll was announced, and honestly, I cannot describe how joyous it felt. It was... Jude Bellingham 95th minute overhead kick levels of excitement. (laughs) 95 minutes seems too long for a kick. No, I mean, I know I'm not a soccer guy. I feel like Marsh felt like it was too long for sure. Oh, Um, yeah. 
I'm just going to go ahead and say it. No, the fuck it wasn't. I will bet my life fucking savings you were not as elated by any election as you were by that tying goal in the 95th fucking minute. Yeah, that's true. That's entirely true, to be fair. <laughs> Gotta call him out like that. I'm going to come back to that in a moment. But quick side note first, because I want to tell you about the weirdest and most pointlessly competitive aspect of UK elections. The royal family. <laughs> <laughs> so, like, the polls all close at 10pm, at which point the polling stations start counting the votes, which a handful of constituencies in the northeast where I grew up decide to take as a declaration of war as they try to outdo each other in how quickly they can declare their results. What? Yeah, well, as they say, if you want something done right, do it in a competitive flurry. Yeah, yeah exactly. Jesus. So this time around, the completely imaginary prize went to longtime champions in Sunderland, who declared their result at 11.14pm, 74 minutes after the last vote was cast, and that's how long it took them to count 40,000 votes. And they beat out competition from nearby Newcastle and from Blythe, but even that was twice as long as their 2001 record of 42 minutes to declare their result. This is a competition only the handful of places around where I grew up believe exists, and they take it exceptionally seriously, and I cannot emphasise enough how much this does not matter at all. Psh. Are you kidding, Marsh? There are several appendages I would give to shorten the agony of election night to 42 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, you'll wait until Republicans get rid of competitive elections, Eli. That'll streamline the shit out. That's yeah. true. That's true. They will. Think about how early they can declare in Russia. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that's true. So Sunderland, Newcastle, Blythe, Hexham, pretty much the entirety of the Northeast declared pretty quickly for Labour, with broad swathes of the country following suit over the course of the evening. In the end, Labour amassed a majority of 174 seats, largely off the back of a total collapse of the Conservatives in the face of challenges from the Lib Dems, the Green Party, and, most notably, Nigel Farage's Reform Party. And there's going to be much more to say about that latter group in future episodes, I'm sure, especially as they took home 14% of the votes and got five seats across the country. Yeah, and look, I know that's not a lot, but the fact that Nigel Farage gets a seat on the bus, let alone in Parliament, <laughs> deeply upsetting. Right, deeply 100%. Upsetting. But this is a major victory for Labour, the scale of which I think is genuinely hard to comprehend if you don't know a great deal about UK politics. Like the Labour Party was essentially founded in 1900 and has taken part in 31 elections since then, and it's only won nine. So we've only ever had seven Labour prime ministers in all of history, and two of those were handed power by their Labour predecessor who retired, meaning that Keir Starmer becomes only the fifth to win power from the Tories ever. There's been more James Bonds than there have been Labour leaders who beat the Tories. Oh, wow. Okay, in that spirit, any chance they're willing to let us kill Rishi Sunak with a giant missile? <laughs> <laughs> Is that... <laughs> Are they open to that? Yeah. Like, for American listeners to try and understand this, imagine if, over the course of a century and a half, you had just five Democrat presidents, a.k.a. the next 150 years after Trump's next term. Mm. Yeah. I know you're joking, but the idea of our country lasting 150 years after Trump's next term is impossibly <laughs> optimistic, Trump. Like, well, the you. land will still yeah, be sure. yeah, I, I, I also want to want to be super clear on how much I do not wish we had a Democratic president 150 years ago, <laughs> right. just for the historically yeah. inclined. Uh, so I also want to give a special shout out to the new MP for Morecambe and Loonsdale, Labour's Lizzie Collinge, who is a friend of mine and a regular at QED. It's really cool. In fact, I believe she might have been the one many years ago who explained to Tom and Cecil that the Queen owns all the swans and caused them to collapse in hysterics in the bar at QED. <laughs> Watching her get sworn into Parliament was a fucking cool moment, as was watching my friend and fellow sceptic Danny Chambers getting sworn in as the Lib Dem MP for Winchester. We've got two now. Nice. Yeah. There's a congressman who goes to the magic convention I go to sometimes. The organizers asked me not to talk to him. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, when my old friends are getting sworn in, it usually involves telling the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. We run in different circles. <laughs> that <Mark>. is true. <laughs> So that said, this was far from a perfect election for Labour. Critics within the left of the Labour Party will point out that the turnout was really low and that Starmer's Labour actually got fewer votes this election than Jeremy Corbyn's did in 2017 and 2019. That said, it is worth pointing out that Corbyn's Labour lost both of those elections mm -hmm. comprehensively in the case of 2019. And in case anybody was unsure, 
most popular loser is not a title that comes with the power to actually improve anybody's lives. I don't know. I did pretty good in high school, Marsh, to be honest with you. <laughs> but Marsh, don't worry. If I know anything about the far left, it's that they never let being demonstrably mathematically wrong affect their confidence in their convictions. So <laughs> yep, yep. don't worry, buddy. They're going to be okay. <laughs> and the other thing is there were some serious unforced errors from Starmer's campaign this time around as well. Like Notably, his reluctance to condemn Israel for the ongoing violence in Gaza, which costs Labour a lot of votes, particularly in areas with large Muslim populations. Leading Labour figure Jonathan Asworth actually surprisingly lost his seat in Leicester South to an independent candidate who ran on a pro-Palestine ticket. And Starmer himself actually saw his large lead in his own seat cut by 15%, with the pro-Palestine campaigner Andrew Feinstein taking over 7,000 seats off him. Yeah, I can't imagine that'll have any relevance in American politics, though, Biden administration. I'm sure <laughs> I'm sure those 500-pound bombs will be fine. Yeah. And then most seriously of all was the Chingford and Woodford Green candidate. Oh, fuck you. Those are real yeah. places. <laughs> this is where Labour had actually deselected their candidate, Faisal Shaheen, over her social media support for Gaza. And that social media support included hitting like on a video of Jon Stewart criticising Israel. And that was enough for her to be deselected by Labour. And she actually resigned from the Labour Party and ran as an independent and gained 12,000 votes. But Labour also ran a candidate against her who also gained 12,000 votes, which allowed the former Tory leader and genuinely despicable human being Ian, Ian Duncan Smith to hold on to that seat with 17,000 votes. And getting rid of IDS would have been a huge scalp and Labour have completely fucked up here. I just I can't imagine that'll have any relevance in American politics yeah. either. <laughs> but Duncan's going to be awesome to the people of Gaza, though, right? Like Duncan's a big, <laughs> yeah, exactly. right, yeah, big supporter. It's going to yeah, hundred yeah. percent. Great message. So, in his first speech as Prime Minister, Keir Starmer made it clear that he wants to re-emphasize the public service aspect of politicians and the office of Prime Minister, and that he's here to serve the whole of the country, whether they voted for him or not. And that's a theme that he's actually reiterated again and again in his first week in a bit of office. And personally, I'm, I'm cautiously optimistic about this. You know, we've had a soul-crushing 14 years of Tory rule in which they looked only to consolidate their power and hand off wealth to their friends. But now we have the chance for something different. And for the moment, at least, we should allow ourselves to be genuinely excited at that prospect. Well, yeah. And on that note of cautiously planning for the future, a word from our sponsor, Trust and Will. Okay, and then? Uh, delete all content. Why would that be the button you push? Because it's the red one. Hey, guys, what are you, uh, what are you up to? Oh, hey, Marsh. I'm trying to show Eli the ropes in case anything ever happens to me, and it's it's not going well. Ah, yeah, that sounds tricky. But if you want to secure the future for you and your loved ones, why don't you try Trust and Will? What's trust and will with trust and will you can create and manage a custom estate plan starting at just 199 dollars go to trustandwill.com forward slash skeptocrat for 10 percent off plus free document shipping but marsh is it easy it sure is noah i used trust and will to set things up for me and anna when they became a sponsor and it was so easy that i immediately used it for my mom as well their simple step-by-step -step process guides you from start to finish with ease and live customer support is available through phone chat and email Secure your assets and protect your loved ones with Trust and Will. Get 10% off plus free shipping of your estate plan documents by visiting trustandwill.com forward slash skeptocrat. That's 10% off and free shipping at trustandwill.com slash skeptocrat. Thanks, Marsh. Hey, Marsh, if we're going to publish a podcast, what color button do you think you should push? Uh, the one that says publish? Okay, well then why do they even have colors? R red isn't even the go color. And we're back next up in headlines in Paychecks and Balances news. New York Congresswoman and future president, if y'all can keep the dictator in chief out of office for a few more years, we promise, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. Like Not like that. Yeah, no. <laughs> Is it right. I wrote that before the shots were fired. Um, <laughs> So, but uh, AOC introduced articles of impeachment against Clarence Thomas and Sam Alito for the <clears throat> crimes of failing to disclose millions of dollars in gifts from individuals with business before their court and for their, quote, pattern of refusal to recuse from consequential matters before the court, end quote. 
And though doomed to stall in the Republican-controlled House, these articles represent a significant rhetorical escalation in the attack against the two most nakedly corrupt people in the employ of the U.S. taxpayers. Yeah, which is saying something because, like, Boss Tweed existed. You know what I'm saying? Well, to hit the current current yeah, <laughs> employee. Exactly. It's the two most nakedly corrupt people in the employ of the US taxpayers so far. But, you know, We're, at this well, yeah. rate, when Sotomayor retires, her replacement is going to be coin operated. That's how that's going to work. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. Self checkout and just report. Yeah. <laughs> So yeah, so as I'm sure we're all aware, every few months for the past year and a half or so, ProPublica will come out with another expose about millions of dollars in undisclosed gifts, trips, and shady real estate deals that Clarence Thomas and or Sam Alito have benefited from. And in almost all of those cases, the gifts come from people who either have business before the court or who aren't hard to six degrees to bacon back to people with business before the court. And in every single one of those instances, the beneficiary of the largesse has voted in favor of of the donor. In other words, billionaires are openly buying decisions from the Supreme Court. We have receipts, literal receipts. Yeah. And not only have we not done anything about it, but those motherfuckers haven't even recused from the cases that we know they've been paid off for. I'm starting to think, guys, I know this is crazy, but I'm starting to think unelected tools of the current administration who serve for their entire lives with no possibility of check or balance might not be an amazing way to do laws. Am I crazy? Am I crazy? <laughs> maybe, yeah. But maybe Clarence Thomas just thought that checks and balances meant checking his bank balances. Maybe oh, that's well, there possible. You go. Yeah, that's no, possible. <laughs> So, in all, she introduced five articles of impeachment, three against Thomas and two against Alito, and sure, it's bad optics for three-fifths of the articles to go against the black guy, but hey, you work with what you got. In this case, that's one article against Thomas for failing to disclose gifts from millionaire Republican and Nazi enthusiast Harlan Crow. Redundant. To, yeah, no, sorry. Uh, two against him for failing to recuse on cases connected with his miserable piece of shit of a wife. One against Alito for failing to disclose luxury travel. And one for his failure to recuse on the January 6th case, which one could pretty reasonably argue is connected to his wife. And like I said, this effort is unlikely to go anywhere, but that doesn't matter. These particular articles of impeachment do not have to succeed. But what we need to do is raise the alarm, keep this shit in the news, and remind Democratic voters that there is a path to a liberal majority on the Supreme Court that doesn't require me bleeping out Eli. Again, watertight alibi, never even been to Pennsylvania. It's never. True. I don't like nope. that state. Never been you know, there. So, yeah. Now, if we, of course, we have to, to get our majority, assume that at least one of those motherfuckers is as corrupt as these two. My money's on Kavanaugh. Eventually, <laughs> we're going to capture that motherfucker boofing or something. But anyway, as AOC said in a statement upon filing of these articles, quote, the unchecked corruption crisis on the Supreme Court has now spiraled into a constitutional crisis threatening American democracy writ large, end quote. So every blow we throw matters, even if it doesn't land. A ah, little too soon to be celebrating failed attempts, Noah. No, I know. I wrote this before the thing. Yeah, right. And in protecting Paris news, the Olympics are impressive in a lot of ways. It's a chance to witness the stunning pinnacle of human athletic achievement. It's an opportunity to be warmed in the glow of camaraderie and friendship as our nations, different in so many ways, unite in the spirit of fair play. And also, even though everybody gets at least four fucking years to plan, when the time comes, absolutely nobody is ready. Uh, excuse me, did you not see the opening ceremony for London 2012? You know, with all the chimney sweeps and the buses <laughs> and the hospital beds. That was the last time anyone in Britain got to see an NHS bed. Do not take that away from me. <laughs> that's fair, that's fair. <laughs> right, and what about like, two years later in Russia? They had the overwhelming majority of their Olympic Village toilets hooked up to something. It was great. <laughs> yeah, the majority, you say. <laughs> yeah. And that appears to be the case once again with the Paris Olympics this week, as the New York Times learned that the Parisian government are busing homeless immigrants out of the city, you know, just while company is over. Yeah, just the mayor of Paris sweeping homeless people under a rug and cramming them all into the closet under the stairs, hoping that the guests don't notice. Right. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Think about how inhumane you have to be when your chief concern about the homeless people of Paris in July yeah. is that motherfuckers yeah. are going to see them. Yeah, uh, it gets worse. So according to the paper of note, uh, the Parisian government has bust away more than five 
thousand immigrants since April to neighboring cities. Uh, this is supposed to be part of their plan to provide housing for people in the country's 10 new shelters spread across the nation. And the government has denied it had anything to do with the Olympics. Mm -hmm. But in an email obtained by the French newspaper L'Equipe, a housing official said that the goal was to, quote, identify people on the street in sites near Olympic venues, end quote. So, uh, yeah, that was lying. Yep, lying. Uh, but there's actually an even bigger problem with this program. Uh, many of the immigrants who were a part of this program, who were told they'd be getting housing and social support wherever they were going were not told they'd also be going through asylum screenings. Oh. Which, if they failed, would mean deportation. Yeah. In fact, it's such a vulnerable position that many are telling people not to accept the offer of help, with one lawyer in Paris calling the program a, quote, anti-chamber to deportation. Well, we said we were busting them out of Paris. We didn't say how far out of yeah. Paris. Syria yeah. is... Uh, we said we'd give them housing, and we got a really great deal on some property that just became available in Rwanda. So it all <laughs> makes sense. Yeah. Sure. The French government putting the gall into Kigali. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> Worst of all, many of the shelters these people are promised they're heading to don't exist. The Times followed several people who reached cities only to find that the help they'd been promised wasn't there in any form, and they had no way of getting back. Okay, we don't have roofs, no, but uh, we know a great wall guy. Uh, <laughs> Mexico will pay for it. There will be no problem. <laughs> The thing is, it's not like they have no way back. You know, they could just head back on foot. And if they make it in under two hours, they'll even get a medal for it. That's yeah, well, there true. you go. Yeah, that's <laughs> the week. So, yeah, with the French elections just having nearly elected um, racism, the idea, you have to wonder <laughs> how much of this was for the Olympics and how much of this is kind of new government policy. Mm -hmm. Either way, it doesn't fill me with the thought of open hearts and brotherly love. Mm. And on the idea of needing to phone home, let's toss things to our second sponsor this week, Mint Mobile. You've never seen Broadchurch with David Tennant? No, is it good? A legendary. You don't know what you're missing. Hey guys, what you doing? Uh, I'm trying to fill Noah in about all the amazing shows over the pond that he's missing. Yeah, they, they all sound made up. Well, they're not made up. They're really good and you're missing out. <laughs> I get it, Marsh, because that's how I feel about Mint Mobile. What's... Mint Mobile. Mint Mobile offers premium wireless for $15 a month when you purchase a three-month plan. It's such an awesome deal, there's no way you can keep it to yourself. Wait, 15 bucks a month? That's amazing. But do I get to keep my phone and phone number? You sure do. Use your own phone with any Mint Mobile plan and bring your phone number along with all your existing contacts. All right, Eli, I'm sold. Where do I sign up? To get this new customer offer and your new three-month premium wireless plan for just 15 bucks a month, go to mintmobile.com slash skeptocrat. That's mintmobile.com slash skeptocrat. Cut your wireless bill to 15 bucks a month at mintmobile.com slash skeptocrat. $45 upfront payment required, equivalent to $15 per month. New customers on the first three-month plan only. Speed slower above 40 gigabytes on unlimited plan. Additional taxes, fees, and restrictions apply. See Mint Mobile for details. All right, thanks. Ooh, uh, what about Shetland? The, there's a drama named after the pony? It's a place, Eli. The pony is named after a place. Right, sure, of course. You're picturing a policeman as a pony, aren't you? Yup! <laughs> <laughs> so was I. So was I. And we're back. Next up in headlines in commiseratory news. Fantastic. There are many things better than seeing Labour win a general election, but one thing that can top it is watching the Tory party lose a general election. <laughs> Especially watching this Tory party lose this election and lose it as badly as they did. So the Tories went into the election with 372 of the country's 650 seats and they ended the night with just 121 seats. Wow. The lowest in the history of the Tory party. And some of that is to do with the, su the success of Labour, but mostly the Tories lost a lot of seats to the Liberal Democrats and to Reform UK and to the Green Party. It was fucking glorious. Right. It's like if Muhammad Ali had lost the belt to a baby. Right. Well, but after he just crashed the economy. Yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> 
And so I've, I've mentioned before that the that here in the UK we vote for local politicians, not for parties. And but the thing is, the election night implications of that might not be entirely obvious. Because in the US, election night is, you know, infographics of states and watching numbers go brr. But in the UK, <laughs> we actually get to watch our politicians find out that they've lost in real time in school halls across the country. Really? Oh, yeah. Okay. I mean, there's no price I wouldn't pay to watch Trump lose on pay-per-view in November, Marsh. So Right. Yeah. So you just line up a bunch of plates full of ketchup in front of him. <laughs> yeah. So that's it, right? Because think of the worst politician you know. Oh, we're way ahead of you, man. <laughs> <laughs> okay, now imagine them having to stay up until like five or six o'clock in the morning in the sports hall of their local junior high to then have to line up alongside every other candidate in their local race, often including several people dressed as fictional characters, <laughs> only to be told on national television that they've lost their job by like 700 votes. And now imagine that 650 times over the course of seven hours. Oh Throw in a God. bottle of wine and honestly, it's my ideal Thursday night. A bottle of wine, Mark. A <laughs> bottle of wine. Our guy can't stay up past 8 p.m. Is that going to be a problem? Yeah. <laughs> I think the Brits might have accidentally manifested the hell that I actually wish on Republicans. Are you guys taking applications? Mm -hmm. I would love. Yeah. Oh, it's so good. Part. It's so good. Because obviously the absolute best moments, the ones that you really stay up for, are when the big names fall. You know, especially, ideally, people who've been in the cabinet who absolutely deserved to go. And the first sign of that that we got was at 3 or 9 a.m. when the Conservative Justice Secretary, Alice Chalk, lost Cheltenham, and at the exact same moment, their Defence Secretary, Grant Chaps, lost in Welland Hatfield. I don't know which of those were the people and which were the towns. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> and then an hour later, the leader of the House of Commons, Penny Mordaunt, she lost in Portsmouth North. Um, you'll know her as the lady that, that Prince Charles's coronation, who held up that sword for like a really long time. And yes, that made okay. her a, a prospect for leader. She was generally tipped to be the next Tory leader after the election. But she can't be because she fell on that ceremonial sword at 4 or 9 a.m. Not literally, but she looked sleepy. It could have happened, everybody. Yeah, it right. could have happened. <laughs> she wasn't literally tipped either. But but again, we're, we're, we're headed that way. We were yeah. headed that way. And then after that penny had dropped, the next to go was Johnny Mercer in Plymouth Moorview, who had, he'd actually falsely accused his Labour opponent of stolen military valour during his local campaign. Um, <laughs> Mercer, it's worth pointing out, was the Tories' veterans minister when he made those false oh accusations. My God. Oh, yeah. He's now been dishonourably discharged by his electorate. And then at 4.40 a.m., Rishi Sunak actually successfully defended his seat in Richmond and North Allerton, winning by 12,000 votes in a constituency of 48,000 votes. But for some reason, he didn't look very happy. Um, huh. in, in his speech, he even conceded the whole election to Labour while standing next to his local rivals, including Count Binface and an independent candidate and YouTube prankster called Nico Omilana, who was standing behind Sunak for the duration of his speech, holding up a giant L. Yeah. And <laughs> if the rest of the candidates had agreed to hold up their letters, it would have been a total zinc. <laughs> Nobody's a team player anymore. That's all I'm saying. Yeah. Okay. Honestly, if it came down to where we could either have nationalized healthcare or this form of like involuntary concession speeches i think america should take this idea first obviously right? yes, absolutely thank you. and you could argue that sunak actually conceded early because at the time labor had an unassailable lead but weren't yet guaranteed a majority because as i say we have 650 seats so a party needs 326 seats for that majority and in an outcome so beautiful it made me doubt my own atheism, Labour's 326th seat of the night, the one that secured them control of the country, was in North East Somerset and Hannam, where they defeated Conservative candidate and evil schoolmaster from every kid's book about a boarding school, <laughs> Jacob <laughs> Rees-Mogg. Okay, so you know how Thanos was somehow like the last to turn into dust in Avengers Endgame? Mm. It's like that, but cooler and with a less likable villain. Yeah, right. Yes. <laughs> but, a, but a eugenicist nonetheless. So it's, yeah, exactly. uh, it's yeah, right. Yeah. No, yeah. 
And then at, at 5 a.m., the sweet sound, like this was at 5 a.m., the sweet sound that I fell asleep to and that I wish I could fall asleep to every single night was actually Jacob Rees-Mogg's concession speech, which he gave while standing next to a candidate who was wearing a balaclava depicting a full English breakfast. And to be honest, <laughs> that was way more dignified than Rees-Mogg deserved. Oh, God, that mask is so fucking creepy. I've had nightmares <laughs> about it ever since I saw it. You know, it looks like the thing's late-term abortion is in a suit. It really does. It no one's really talking does. about Jacob Reese Mogg, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> the other guy has beans. Yeah, he has beans <laughs> on his head. Uh, but alas, I wasn't still awake at 7 a.m. for the moment of the election. Southwest Norfolk and the former Prime Minister, Liz Truss. Oh, please tell me that Labour's candidate was the lettuce. <laughs> <laughs> so she was defending a lead of 24,000 votes from the 2019 election. That's how far in front she was in a constituency with a turnout of 44,000. Oh, my God. So losing this was going to be tough. But if trust proved anything from her time in power, it's that she's capable of pulling off breathtaking and historical losses. <laughs> and sure enough, she lost her seat, chalking up the highest ever swing in a seat from Conservative to Labour in the history of UK general elections. Wow. Ooh. Yeah. And the announcement for this was genuinely preceded by a sarcastic slow hand clap from the people who were in the room <laughs> with It literally oh, was. No. Beautiful. <laughs> yeah. And according to The Guardian, that wasn't the first time that the record for biggest Tory loss in a seat was beaten that night. It was the 47th oh, time ooh, that record what? had been broken that night. Okay, Marsh, I, I have a question. Uh, in the photos you've included in our notes and that I've seen on the news, everyone seems to be wearing what I can only describe as state fair prize pins. <laughs> are, are, are these indications of their party or how much we can sell their bacon for? Because I am right? open to either answer. <laughs> It's definitely both. The ones who lose, you can turn it. You're welcome to turn into bacon. Is that the oh, one nice. guy's already bacon? Yeah, beans so guy is ready there. to yeah. go. Yeah. <laughs> so all in all, this was a catastrophic night for the Tories. They lost four out of the five seats occupied by their five last prime ministers, oh, losing wow. seats previously held by Truss, May, Johnson, and Cameron. They all went. Only Sunak retained them. In many parts of the country, they didn't even come second. You know, they're behind the Lib Dems or Reform or the Greens. This might actually turn out to be the extinction level event that was predicted. And, you know, while I can't rejoice too much at the thought that the gap that the Tories are going to leave will be filled by Nigel Farage LLC, mm -hmm. for now we can at least bask in their glorious failure. Oh, fuck yeah, we can. And finally tonight in Chat GPT News. When the automobile first started to become popular... Many were frightened by its mind-boggling speed and size. Rumors spread that riding in a car was bad for your health, could give women hysteria and addle the brains of children. Soon, those rumors turned into a cultural movement, and many attempted to pass laws banning the automobile on that basis. Well, the more things change, the more they stay the same, as two octogenarian journalists have joined the fight against ChatGPT and OpenAI for plagiarizing their books because they... Looked at the internet. <laughs> okay, all right. If you wanted to pick a fight with Tom, you could have just insulted his kids or something, Eli. <laughs> well, no, he cares about the internet way more. No, you're right, actually. <laughs> this. Yes, Nicholas Gage, age 84, and Nicholas Bazbanes, age 81, are joining authors like John Grisham, Jody Pickholt, and Game of Thrones novelist George R.R. R. Martin, and media outlets such as the New York Times, Chicago Tribune, and Mother Jones in suing OpenAI for copyright infringement because they have no idea what AI is, how large language models work, or, it appears, what a copyright even is. Okay, so if you wanted to pick a fight with the audience, Eli, you could have just insulted their kids or something, okay? <laughs> Yeah, if I was George R.R. R. Martin, I would probably spend less of my time criticising the creation of works of fiction that are wholly derivative of existing artworks within a genre. I oh! keep <laughs> Damn. No, sometimes he steals from history. Yeah. <laughs> At least you don't have to wait seven years for ChatGPT to finish a prompt, George. <laughs> now, I know what you're thinking, podcast listener. Eli... Why are you even bringing this up? Two more old guys joined a doomed lawsuit that is absolutely going to settle as the hysterical cash grab it is. But 
The truth is, there's a lot of very smart people who are buying into this narrative. And frivolous lawsuits like this one not only lend the narrative credibility, they prevent people who should be using these tools from getting the access they should because they're being sold lies by hysterical anti-tech Luddites at best and crash-grabbing conmen at worst. There's a meme going around on Facebook with more than 50,000 shares right now that claims you can tell AI image generators steal art because the squiggles you see in the corners of the pictures are the remains of artists' signatures they copied from. Yep. Okay, so that's obviously stupid. You know, those squiggles are the AI spotting that stuff made by real people tends to have some squiggles down there and then mindlessly following suit. You know, it's, mm-hmm. it's cargo cult artistry rather than a computer putting on one of those little monocles and trying to be some sort of sophisticated art forger. <laughs> yeah, right, yeah. yeah uh-huh. and, and just to be clear, if you're pissed that technology is taking the artistic jobs, but you weren't pissed when it took the labor jobs, you need to confront how inherently classist that yeah. is. Right? Like, sure, you could say it's different when it's taking jobs that we don't want to do versus jobs that we do want to do, but it, it, it was somebody's means of making a living far more so than writing or music ever were, and, and not everybody can fucking draw. Yeah. It's an interesting comparison. Uh, So real quick, just technologically speaking, AI, LLMs, image generators, right? Learning algorithms, they they don't steal information any more than a Google search does, right? So think about it. A Google search takes information that's publicly available on the internet, text, pictures, videos, and then it distills that into a product that they in turn sell to people. But when you search for a pizza place near me, Google doesn't steal the names and brands of all the local pizza places. That's what fair use is. And everybody knows that, at least when it comes to Google. Okay, so yeah, that's true. But it is also worth pointing out that Google doesn't then set up a hundred pizza shop that are also called Tony D's House of Pie that also claim to use the exact same secret recipe. That bit wouldn't be covered under fair use. Yeah, that's Fair. true. That's true. And look, there are philosophical harms to this misinformation as well. Like, re- remember when we were kids and our teachers told us we couldn't use Wikipedia because any old person could edit it? Yeah, we were all kids when there was Wikipedia. <laughs> <laughs> And then we realized what an incredible resource it was. And we all sort of chuckle at how old fashioned those teachers were. Well, that's what's happening here. Except instead of having to hoist a volume of Encyclopedia Britannica down from the library shelf, people aren't getting the legal advice that they otherwise couldn't afford. They're unable to take advantage of an LLM's ability to write, express, and distill information in a way that they might not be able to. And slowing this technology down does not protect artists or art in the slightest. OpenAI is owned by Microsoft. They can buy Jody Picoult's living soul from Christ of Nazareth himself (laughs) as he sits in his throne in heaven. But what it will do is it will protect a social hierarchy based on who has access to that information and writing ability. And and writing ability. That's the fucking key. Right. Because it's also pretty classist when you consider how many people can't afford to hire a dude to write a scary sounding letter uh, for them at $400 an hour who will be able to with these tools. Right. I mean, Eli will write you one for far cheaper, but with far less desirable outcomes. Exactly. (laughs) Yes. My hallucinations are on purpose. And look. I understand and empathize what it's like to be scared by AI, okay? We are significantly less than 10 years away from AI synthesizing every episode of all of our podcasts into perfect clones that talk like us and joke like us. And based on the I agree boxes that everybody on this podcast has clicked, we might be entitled to some of that money that that new AI-generated podcast makes, right? The answer to protecting yourself from the threat of fast-moving technology is solidarity and commitment to worker and artistic rights. It means joining a union, even if that union is filled with Trump-supporting assholes, or buying some art. There you go. With money, yeah? Or maybe just supporting your favorite podcasts on Patreon. That is what's going (laughs) to save the world, people. That. 
And on that note, we're going to close it out. Thanks to Eli Bosdick, thanks to Michael Marshall, and thanks to all the listeners who liked us and followed us on all the various internets. Please keep doing that. Please keep listening, and please keep telling your friends. And if you find the naive stupidity of our giving away a free show business model to be oddly charming, you can send us gifts of money at patreon.com slash skeptocrat, just like all the fine folks that Heath is going to thank by name on the next episode. And whether or not you're feeling financially benevolent like those fine people, if you enjoyed our brand of whimsy and you'd like to hear more dick jokes free of charge, check out our brother and sister shows, The Scathing Atheist, God Awful Movies, D&D Minus, and Citation Needed, available wherever podcasts live. We have just one last thing. Let's compliment that penis. Special thanks to Brian Slotnick of Evil Drafts on Mars. He's the creator of the virtuosic musical stylings you heard today, which were used with permission. You should definitely check him out by using the links we'll provide or by Googling the only band called Evil Giraffes on Mars. Until next time, catchphrase sign off. And Morgan, I hope it goes without saying, but please cut out where I almost came in on the I'm Michael Marshall line. I, I usually come in second on this one. That's true. Yeah. Yeah. So it just occurred to me that I was saying, like giving Morgan notes on an episode that I'm going to edit. <laughs> He's in your heart. That's a thing. He's, it must yeah. be. That, that must be You're it. Channeling your inner Morgan. That's right. You know what it is? Is this that damn song that he did has been in my fucking head ever since I listened to it the first time. And... Uh, all right. And Mint Mobile. The preceding podcast was a production of Puzzle and a Thunderstorm, LLC. Copyright 2024. All rights reserved.